الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه وسن بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode of Ask Huda being broadcasted to you live from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia and the first question for tonight's episode is from a sister who did not mention her name she says, I'm a teacher for a primary school. And since it's nearly Christmas, the school is holding a nativity play where songs about Jesus is being sung. All of them involve shirk, and I don't know what to do. I try not to sing them, but I'm also teaching the class that are preparing, which means that they practice a lot. First of all, in Islam, there is no compromise. So once you know the ruling, there isn't such a thing as embarrassment or I don't know what to do. It is as simple as drawing the line. What is the ruling for a Muslim to celebrate Christmas? It is totally prohibited. What is the ruling on aiding Christians to practice or to celebrate their festivals, it is totally prohibited because these festivals are part of their religion and by us helping them or congratulating them or celebrating it with them, we are imitating them and some scholars say that this nullifies Islam and it is an act of apostasy that people must avoid. Therefore, you have no excuse, none whatsoever in participating in such an event or such a play or Christmas carols or teaching them, though they are children. Yet this is falsehood that a Muslim cannot participate in and must not join or be part of. So if it means that you have to resign your job, so be it. But you have to make it clear that this goes against your religion and hence you cannot uh, be part of it. Dr. Faisal from Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine, Zakallah khair, Akhi. Sheikh, I have one uh, question for you. Yes. Uh, like, there's a uh, wearing the face tags, the Tawis, okay. what we call it. Uh, and the other thing is, like, uh, uh, sometimes if a Sheikh recites Quran and he blows on the water, or uh, anything uh, is it permissible or not because uh, my question is like there are many issues like this where both the sides like some people believe in doing so some people don't and they give uh, reference of uh, mainly from the hadith like we cannot show and the other side says it's a weak hadith it is not a weak hadith all these uh, things so uh, can you please throw some light on it which side a common person like me goes. Okay, I will answer the question. Dr. Faisal's question is basically about a person who's confused. And he finds it difficult because he reads a lot, he listens to a lot of various schools and maybe various sects and cults, and he's confused by those whom he listened to. And he doesn't know what is right and what is wrong. So what is the best thing for him to do? Akhi, this is a universal dilemma. And Allah Azza wa Jal has made it clear to us. The Prophet had made it clear to us. Allah says in two locations of the Quran, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. So in your case, if you do not know the ruling, you have to ask the people of knowledge. So the second question would be, how would I 
identify the people of knowledge. And this has to go under the process of learning about the sheikh you're asking or trying to follow. You have to learn about what the Prophet ﷺ was doing at the time and his companions. And this is why when we say that the best and the safest methodology of practicing Islam is Salafiyyah. Why? Because you go back to the Prophet's time and his companions and the best three generations, three centuries, which the Prophet said, the best of generations is my century, then the following, then the following. So by following the footsteps, you definitely uh, 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 would be in safe hands. So you have to identify the scholars. And the scholars usually have a number of characteristics that you cannot miss. They have to be knowledgeable. They speak about the Quran and the Sunnah. And if they don't know Arabic, then they're not scholars. With all due respect, you can know a lot of things. But if you do not know Arabic, you are depending on a translator. You are depending on a translation. But you're not relying or depending on the Quran and the Sunnah to the sources because you're unable to understand them. The Shaykh has to be a person with uh, um, good moral conduct, good akhlaq. He's kind, he's tolerant, he's not arrogant, he's not abusive, he's not using dirty words. He has to be righteous and God-fearing. So if he doesn't pray Fajr in the masjid, and if he deals with haram as if it's an easy thing to do, he has no problem with free mixing, he has no problem with listening to music, and what kind of a sheikh is he? And he has to be a person who looks up and glorifies and uh, uh, knows the value of the sunnah. A person who looks at the sunnah and does this, when you say, Akhi, the Prophet said so, he says, no, 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 no. Yeah, as if, يعني, uh, subhanallah, and there are so-called scholars who are like this, when they come and you tell them, Akhi, the Prophet says, it is uh, 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 prohibited for a woman who believes in Allah and the day of judgment to travel without a mahram. He said, yeah, 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 I know this hadith, it's in Bukhari and Muslim, but the companions did otherwise. The scholar so-and-so said, it's okay. Subhanallah, can a scholar ignore and neglect the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ just because a companion uh, uh, did not apply it or just because a scholar in here or there said otherwise? Definitely not. So you have to f first identify the scholar, then you have to look into issues of aqidah. Aqidah, the companions never differed in. So issues of ta'weez or, or amulets, and thinking that they protect you other than Allah Azza wa Jal. This is shirk. The Prophet says, مَن تَعَلَّقَ تَمِيمَةً فَلَا أَتَمَّ اللَّهُ هُلَا That whoever wears a tamima or an amulet, may Allah does not save him or protect him. And the Prophet is, is, is making dua against this person because he's committing shirk. Blowing in water, Quran, and reciting it, there's no hadith supporting it. But we know that uh, blowing the Quran is supported by the hadith. And we know that Zamzam is a cure for uh, a lot of illnesses and a means of healing. Some of the companions, it was reported that they used to do this. So this has reference from the Salaf, and hence it is, inshallah, permissible, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Fatima from the Emirates, and I apologize for the delay. Hello, Salaam Alaikum. Salaam wa Barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, I want to ask a question. Yes. Is it sin to sketch cartoons? Uh, first question and the second question if they are printed pictures of human blank if the children they color that humans or animals uh, If they color it is that a sin? Uh, is it photo photogra that? photographs or drawings? Hello uh, photographs or drawings uh, Photographs printed photographs they are blank and in the art class they are asked to fill in with colors. Is that a sin? Okay. And catching cartoons like humans like Ben 10 and okay. all that is that also a sin? I will answer, inshallah. Uh, Huda from Malta? Yes, Abu Miriam. Yes, Huda? From Malta, yes. Yes, what can I do for you? Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
I would like to ask a question regarding the musical instruments. Okay. What's uh, your question? Uh, is it really haram to play any musical instruments? And why? Because in the old days we have like Mozart, Beethoven, they were all young and were like genius in music. So my question is, if it is haram, why did Allah give them this... Um, uh, this, um, this Gift. Good, something good to write music. Okay. I will answer. Any more questions? Uh, that's it. That's all. Okay, I will answer. And I would like to thank you for the all the pro, the Huda programs. I watch them and they are all very nice and interesting and I have learned a lot. Alhamdulillah. From all the programs. All the programs. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair and I will answer your question. Barakallahu feekum. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Wa salamatullah. Fatma from the Emirates, she's saying, what's the ruling on sketching cartoons? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is why it is essential that you connect everything we do or say to the Quran or to the Sunnah. Because we believe Islam is a way of life. And it is not something that is man-made. Uh, it is something that is divine. It's the law of Allah Azza wa Jal that must be continuous till the day of judgment. And there's no other law than it. So when we come to a question like, what's the ruling on sketching cartoons? The Prophet said, alayhi salatu ashaddu nasi adhaban yawm al qiyamah al musawwirun. The most severely punished people on the day of judgment are those who draw al musawwirun. Those who draw or make sculptures. So the Prophet is telling us that this is a major sin, one of the greatest and major sins in Islam. And another hadith, Allah Azza wa Jal would say, that who is more transgressive than a person who creates like my creation? Let them create a piece of grain or barley. Let them do this if they can. They cannot. So drawing is totally prohibited in Islam, whether it's two-dimensional or 3D. So whether it's a drawing on a paper or you're making a statue or a sculpture of a human li a being such as an animal, a human being, a living creature that is, a fish, a bird, etc. A tree, it's okay. Um, other than that, it is no problem, inshallah, azza uh, wa jal. We have, uh, I think, Ibrahim from Nigeria. Ibrahim? Najib? Najiba from Nigeria? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Yeah, good evening to you. Um, um, I have two questions. Yes. Um, the first question is, um, lately I've been having an Iman deep, and um, I feel like I'm losing it. So I'm asking if there, there's some dua that I can be making. So you're losing your Iman. I, you're feeling that your Iman is getting I, low. Exactly. It's getting a hold of me, even though I have the zeal to do everything. But then if I'm doing it, my heart is not in it. I pray my qiyam, I do everything, I fast, but then I feel like my heart is not in it. Okay, second question. Um, the second question is, um, if I'm, um, I'm reading, sometimes I forget easily, and then I feel like I can't do it again. So I try to just keep it aside and feel like just down what what is that um if i'm reading i'm reading studying for school okay um when i read i tend to forget easily you you cannot remember so, things you keep on forgetting yes, it. yes i can't remember things yes exactly so um yes i'm i want a dua for that too okay and an advice probably okay i will answer you inshallah Thank you very much. Zachary. You're quite welcome. And, um, okay, Fatima's second question, that what's the ruling if we have a blank photograph and children 
fill it up or color it. Is this permissible? It's an issue of dispute. Some would say that the children themselves did not draw. So they're simply coloring and filling the blanks. Others say, no, this is, again, giving it a color which would not be permissible because it is part of the drawing process. And to me, I would feel that it would be safer to uh, avoid this altogether, inshallah, and to uh, stick to drawing or coloring things that are not alive. Do we have Najiba on the phone? Yes, salam alaikum. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi The previous caller, I thought she was Najiba. Maybe she's, I don't know. Okay, what can I do for you, sister? Yeah, it is me, Najiba. From Bahrain. Yes. Yes, what is your question, please? My question is, please check it is permissible for the lady removing or blocking the head and uh, the hair for hand or leg. It is permissible? To do what? To block or shaving the hand and the leg hair for the lady. Okay. And my second question? Yes. Uh, wearing a jilbab or a kam, then is it permissible for open the eye? To w wearing what? Makeup. Yes. Is it permissible to open the eye? Okay. And the uh, number three question is um, one of my friends she asked me, she's working like. Uh, one, she's working with somebody house. The house they they have for this uh, holiday. They say this the uh, holiday for um, Thanksgiving Day. I don't know either. So what's her question? And this because for for this one uh, for this party they brought some alcohol like this in their house, but she's not giving the uh, the alcohol for them. So she's not starting anything for alcohol in that house. But she's working in that house, but they have alcohol. For this uh, holiday, is it permissible for us to the house or not uh, permissible? What do they have in the iPhone? Alcohol, alcohol. Mm, is, what is yeah, this? Drink. Ah, drink. Okay. Yes, yes, like whiskey, like this, I mean, like, okay. this, I mean, like beer, like this. They both for, for thank you day. For this one, they both, but it's still not finished. They keep it until Christmas. Okay. So she's, 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 she says she's asking if it's for stand that house or not permissible. I will answer your questions, inshallah. Any more? Yes. Okay. Um, no, thank you. Jazakallah khair. Wajazaki. Um Muhammad from Saudi? Uh, um Muhammad. Salamu alaikum. Salamu rahmatullah. Uh, I would like to in, uh, inquire regarding uh, um, a finger he is, which is injured and it needs to be engaged for at least minimum two months. One of the finger. So, uh, regarding the Udo, when I uh, when I read in the YouTube, they say I need to do Tayamum, then I also need to do Udo. And uh, I also mentioned that I need to cause up my sol uh, the solar skin. What is the problem? I could so not. I would like to have your clarification, please. What, what is the problem? Uh, the, my finger is injured, my, and it's okay. like a fracture. Okay. Uh, the finger is fractured and need a bandage. Uh, bandage for two months. It's a requirement for, from the medical that I need to uh, bandage for two months. So it's uh, totally covered. The whole finger is covered. So when I want to pray, uh, the, uh, it's, uh, when I read in YouTube, it says that I need to do uh, Udu, then I need to do Tayamu, and also I need to call up my prayer for these two months. Okay. So may I get your clarification? Any more questions? Yeah, uh, on, oh, thank you. Okay, I will answer, inshallah, Muhammad. Amber from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Sheikh, I have uh, four questions. Okay. Uh, the first one, I want to know the um, etiquette of dua. Like, do we have to say the um, uh, send durud on Prophet before and after? Okay. Or not. Uh, second question, when do we say the istiaza and tasmiya in our salah, like um, uh, during, the, before and start of the surah fatiha or the other surahs, when do we say istiaza and tasmiya? 
Okay. And uh, my third question is, is it, uh, I know it's, uh, we can't wish uh, a Merry Christmas to our Christian friends. Like, it's like saying uh, uh, God had a son or uh, it's like doing shirk, wishing that. Can we also not say like um, Happy um, Diwali to the Hindus or the Happy Easter or Happy Halloween or Happy Thanksgiving? Can we not wish any of like this to yes. okay. um, uh, others, uh, non-Muslims. And uh, my uh, fourth question is like, um, uh, I, uh, I was asked a question, why do we go to Masjid in Nabvi? And my answer was, I go there to pay my homage to the Prophet or to the Messenger of Allah, my respect and my love for the Prophet. Uh, is this answer right or wrong? Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Okay, thank you, Jazakallah. Wa jazaki. And we have Jibril from Nigeria. Okay, I think we lost Brother Jibril. Uh, Huda from Malta, she says, now, the issue of music, is it really haram? Well, to answer this, we have to go back to the references. And in the Quran, there are three locations where Allah Azza wa Jal has prohibited music. And this is, may not be straightforward, but the Sahaba, they acknowledge this to be uh, uh, straightforward. For example, the verse in uh, Surah Al-Isra, Ayah 64, Allah Azza wa Jal tells Shaytan, وَاسْتَفْزِزْ مَنِ اسْتَطَعْتَ مِنْهُمْ بِصَوْتِكَ That provoke whomever you can with your voice. Imam Mujahid, one of the great Imams of Tafsir and of the Salaf, he said that his voice, that is Satan's voice, is musical instruments. Also in Surah Luqman, Allah Azza wa Jal said that among the people who buy with uh, his wealth, lahwa al-hadith, so that he would distract people from Allah's way. And Abdullah ibn Zubair, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and Abdullah ibn Abbas, the three Abdullahs, al-Abadil al-Thalath, they all, uh, may Allah be pleased with them, said that this is in uh, 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 ghina, or musical instruments. And also the ayah at the end of Surah Al-Najm, وَأَنْتُمْ سَامِدُونَ أَسَّمْدُهُ الْغُنَاءَ أَوْ الْغِنَاءَ be the language of Himyar, and they say also it is mentioned there. Regardless of all of this, it was reported in Sahih al-Bukhari, and also in Sunan Abi Dawood, with a connected chain of narrators which is authentic without any doubt and it's sufficient that it is in Al-Bukhari that the Prophet said والسلام, that there will be from my ummah people who would make haram things halal so they would make a, a wearing of silk, fornication, uh, consuming intoxicants and musical instruments halal and this is a clear uh, uh, evidence that the Prophet is telling us that musical instruments are haram now, our uh, sister's uh, question is that such a gift and with worldly standards, if you listen to Beethoven or Mozart or uh, uh, any of the great composers of all times, and you would listen and say, wow, this is a beautiful piece of art. This is true. It is beautiful. It's a gift. If you listen to MJ, for example, Michael Jackson, or if you listen to any of the contemporary artists, you would think that, wow, this is great music, it's a great piece of art. It is. But it is not something that Allah loves. This is satanic. This gift is given to them and they're provoked, like the poets, as mentioned in the Quran, they are given such inspiration by shaitan, by the devil. This is not something divine or something that Allah loves. Likewise, if you go and look at the paintings of Michelangelo, great work of art. If you look at the sculptures, if you look at the, uh, uh, the novels of the plays around worldly matters, worldly uh, uh, standards, excellent work. In Islamic standards, this is a piece of trash. Because this is something that Allah does not love. And this is a test. And this is the uh, 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 thing that defines whether you're a good Muslim or a bad Muslim. And this is why this world we're here to be tested. 
whether we are submitting our will to Allah Azza wa Jal or we have our own standards. So Allah tells us, alayhi salam, that ولا تنكح المشركات حتى يؤمن ولا أمة مؤمنة خير من مشركة ولو أعجبتكم. Allah says, do not marry the idol worshippers among the females, even if you like them, because she is beautiful, she is gorgeous, she is a, uh, she is a knockout. But to marry a slave who is black and ugly, etc., as the, tef- uh, the people of Tafsir say, is far better than marrying such a beautiful woman. So your standards have to change in order to look at things as they are. Not as what we desire or what shaitan makes it beautiful for us. The consensus of the four schools of thought, Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i, and uh, Hanbali school, they all agree that musical instruments are haram. What more do we need evidence from? If it's from the Quran, Sunnah, and the consensus of the four schools of thought. So I hope this answers your question. Uh, Nadia from Saudi. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Sayyidullah. Sheikh, I have four questions. Okay. Um, My number one question is uh, that uh, I got a little bit hurt on my leg. So I can stand in my prayer. I mean, because the bandage is there, I can stand and I can do qiyam, I can do ruku, but I cannot do, go for sajda. So when I, uh, while sajda, I'm sitting on the chair. So I just want to ask you that while sajda, my hands should be on my knees or it should be in the air or uh, some table should be there and I have to put it on that. And uh, my question number two is, uh, I want to ask you, uh, about one hadith, because uh, many times I heard uh, in uh, Huda TV about uh, the wealth so you have uh, said in uh, Sheikh Mansai, many times I have heard that if the woman, she earns or she has uh, the money even given by from uh, her husband or any wealth, uh, she is um, allowed to spend it as she wants, but lawfully. So, but I have uh, gone through with one hadith, I want to clarify this point. In that hadith, it's uh, in Sunan Nisai, uh, it's written, uh, uh, a man asked uh, Prophet Sallam, who is the best woman. So it was written that um, the, uh, the one, uh, who, uh, when her husband looks at her, uh, he becomes uh, happy and uh, when he commands her, she, be, uh, he becomes, uh, he, she obeys at once. And she does not go against his wishes with regards to herself, nor her wealth. So this point I want to clarify according to uh, that. And my question number three. Uh, about uh, niqab, uh, Sheikh, last year I have started uh, to cover my face also, even in front of my family members. Uh, and my, I have taken this permission because I have listened this many times in Hoda TV. And I have taken the permission from my husband. We were going to the mom on the way. He was agreed that, okay, you started. But now uh, after a one third like that, his uh, mind is changed. And he's telling that if there is uh, uh, two opinions, I want to prefer this. Uh, and uh, you have to stop uh, niqab and start hijab only. But uh, this uh, is not easy for me to suddenly stop. And I, I just want to ask you, is it uh, uh, compulsory for me to listen my husband? Because there is uh, istalaf when uh, there are two opinions. Or I have to continue what I want. So, uh, because I told him that uh, he has to find out the hadith for both things. And then I will see which one is uh, better uh, way. But still, I just want to ask you about this. Uh, and it's like one year I have, uh, it's uh, more than one year is completed. Uh, I'm uh, doing niqab. And my fourth question is about uh, traveling. Uh, many times I heard that uh, traveling is not allowed for a woman without mahram. Uh, but I just want to ask you, like here, the people, um, uh, uh, from the other countries, uh, when they uh, send their uh, kids to their uh, home country for studying. So mostly, of course, it's not possible for the father or for any mahram to go every time with them because, you know, the fathers, uh, maybe if anyone has only father mahram and he cannot get the um, uh, holiday every time. For example, two, three times if a girl wants to come back and go back in her holidays and she's studying there. So how can she travel alone? I mean, what is the ruling in that? And you know that the studies here, after the A-levels or after the secondary school, there are no studies for uh, us, for Pakistanis or for the other countries. We cannot go to the universities as they are, okay. as they are very expensive. I got your question, inshallah. I will answer. Thank you very much, Sheikh. You're welcome. Thank Abdul Hadi from Saudi. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu How are you, Dikso? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. What can I do for you? 
yes, I have a question about the mixed groups to learn languages or something like that. Okay. What's the rule of that? In mixing with, with what? With whom? Uh, groups, groups or rooms to study English. Yes, yani same gens, uh, same uh, gender, same yes, sex? Yes, yes, with them female and males. Okay. I will answer you, inshallah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, Akhi. Uh, we have a short break, so stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Zad's group present to you three of the best versions for Sheikh Muhammad Saleh Al-Munajjid in English language. How he treated them. Interaction of the greatest leader, the pilgrim's provision. For more information, please visit one of those websites. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Today's topic is poverty. Poverty in Islamic legislation refers to lacking or falling short of basic necessities. So, anyone who does not have a quantity that satisfies him and his family is considered in poverty and among the destitute. Prophet Muhammad wasallam fed the trial of riches for his nation more than he fed for poverty. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, By Allah, it is not poverty about which I fear for you, but I fear in your case that riches may be given to you as were given to those who had gone before you, and that you begin to vie with one another for them as they vied for them, and that they may destroy you as they destroyed them. This hadith was reported by Al-Bukhari and also in Majmu' al-Fatawa. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. The last caller for tonight until we clear the questions we have is Rihanna from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, I have an important question today. Okay. A young couple, they are in love actually, they are medical students in Kuwait uh, College and as soon as possible they want to do nikah because uh, they know very well that it is haram to talk and because they are in the same class so daily they will see each other and they are inclined towards each other. So the, their parents are not free, they are, as they are overseas, they are not free till March and April. So they don't want to, uh, you know, make all these things haram. So they want to do nikah and their brother, elder brother of the girl, can he be the wali for the girl and get the nikah done? And uh, later on when the wali will be free, then they will do nikah again. It is their saying. So I am asking if it, if, if it is halal, is it okay according to Quran and Sunnah? Is the, is the father agreeing? Is the father agreeing to the marriage? Okay, I think we've lost Rehana. I will answer her question, inshallah. Okay, Najiba from Bahrain, whom I thought her name was Najiba, but maybe she was someone else, I don't know. She says that she does all the rituals and the forms of worship, praying, uh, fasting, reading the Quran, yet she still feels that she's losing her belief, her iman. And this is quite normal. And this is one of the steps of shaitan, so that he would distract you from doing good deeds. Now, if you were in shaitan's shoes, what would you do? If someone is practicing, praying, fasting, reading the Quran, doing the whole nine yards, and he is consistent, what can you do to distract him? Try to send bad influence and bad company. He's not mixing with them. Try to make him love to watch movies or listen to music. He's, mashallah, uh, 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 steadfast on the sharia. In this case, shaitan intervenes personally. He tries to blow his whispers in your ears that you're not finding the beauty of the salat, you're not finding the beauty of the Quran. And then he starts to make you panic. And he starts to make you depressed. This is all from shaitan, and it's all mentioned in the Qur'an. 
إنما النجوى من الشيطان ليحزن الذين آمنوا The secret conversations between the two is from shaitan so that they would depress and uh, put sorrow in the heart of the third person who's not knowing what they're talking about. And this is why it's prohibited. So this is all from shaitan. What to do? Ignore these feelings you're having. Focus on perfecting your salat, on reciting more Quran, making more dhikr, listening to more lectures, surrounding yourself with righteous practicing uh, Muslims 24-7, and with the grace of Allah, a couple of months, and it will all disappear, because you would reach levels beyond anticipation of shaitan, and then he would say to his soldiers, hold, down, hold your horses, this is too much, she's going way up in, in, in good rewards and levels of iman, so let's give her a break for five, six months, and then we will try again, so don't worry about this at all, as long as you're staying away from haram and doing what Allah has ordered you to do. As for studying and losing concentration, being unable to remember, this is dependent on individual uh, uh, people. I have friends who could read books once and memorize it by heart. And I have friends that are not as clever or not as quick in memorizing. These are individual gifts that Allah gives to people. So. All what you can do is work hard, think positive, and never give up. Even if you have to write down the things you uh, uh, read, sometimes you read a page and you, uh, when you reach the end of the page, you don't recall anything. Hold a pen or a marker, and whenever you read a sentence, put a line under the thing that you think that you've benefited or you understood from that sentence. And this way, inshallah, you will have a big difference. Najiba from Bahrain, the actual Najiba, She's saying, what's your ruling on removing the hair of the legs and the body uh, and the, uh, uh, the arms of a woman? This is totally permissible in any fashion, inshallah, providing that a second woman would not look at you when doing this. So the arms is okay, the legs is okay, but the thighs and the private parts, this you have to do on your own. Um, secondly, what's your ruling on wearing niqab? Niqab is... The face veil that has an opening for the eyes. So it's like a Zoro mask or the ninja mask or whatever you can call it. And of course the eyes would be visible, but it, it is permissible as in the hadith of Ibn, Mas Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, to show one eye. And scholars say that showing two eyes is okay. But see, people nowadays go to extreme. So the eye itself is like this, so I can see the road. And there's nothing wrong in that. But when it goes big and then your eyebrows is showing and part of your cheek and cheeks and uh, uh, maybe uh, up to, to the middle of the nose, you are concealing all the ugly things in your face and only putting out the beautiful things. So when you show your eyes, the people would be in fitna more than uh, uh, they should be. So yes, you, can, you must cover your face properly and leave an opening only for your eyes and not to exceed that. Uh, her third question is an, a may, housemate that works for Kafir uh, family and they celebrate Thanksgiving, Easter, Christmas and they have lots of wine and, and, and intoxicants in the house. She must not work there. She must leave them because this is a kafir house, this is a place of sin, and she cannot deal with cleaning uh, uh, after them, or washing the dishes, and all this haram stuff. And, and what would a Muslim do in such an environment, such a corrupt and evil environment? She should flee that place, inshallah. Okay, and uh, Umm Muhammad from Saudi Arabia, she says that she has a fractured finger, and someone told her that every time she wants to pray, she has to make wudu, and then she has to perform tayammum, and she has, has to make up for the missed prayers, or the prayers that she prayed without tayammum. This is totally bogus. This is not correct. In Islam, if you have a fractured finger or hand or an arm, and you want to make wudu, if you are unable to wash your limbs that are supposed to be washed in wudu, but because there's a bandage on it, or there's a cast on it, then all what you have to do is wipe over it. And you do not require to make any tayammum 
Alhamdulillah. So whoever told you this, he was wrong. Amber from Saudi Arabia, she says, what are the etiquettes of dua? You have to first of all praise Allah Azza wa Jal if this is not prescribed dua. What do we mean by prescribed? There are duas that the Prophet used to do after salat, before going to bed, after, uh, when going out of the home, like Bismillah wa kaltu Allah wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. So you say this as it is. You don't put anything before or after. But there are unprescribed duas. So for example, to, uh, after this show, I have to go and buy a car maybe. So I raise my hands, face the qibla. These are all parts of the etiquette of dua. Praise Allah. Allahumma lak alhamd, hamdan kathiran, tayyiban, mubarakan fi. Then offer salutation to the Prophet. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammadin kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala Ibrahim inna kahmidu majid. Then I go to my dua. Oh Allah Azza wa Jal, make whatever I'm going to buy a good car and with the cheapest price uh, possible. That's it. And this should be done in all uh, duas that are not prescribed or not in sujood, etc. Um, when do we say, A'udhu Billah Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim? In prayer, you say it at the very beginning, once, A'udhu Billah Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. The Tasmiyah, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, you say it whenever you recite the Fatiha, this is recommended, or you recite a new surah. But if you're going to recite an ayah, like Ayat Al-Kursi, you don't recite the Fatiha. If you recite something from the middle of the surah, you don't recite the Fatiha. Only uh, the Basmala, that is, let me uh, uh, rephrase that. You recite the basmala only when you recite a new surah from the beginning. But if you recite an ayah or a surah from the middle, you do not recite the basmala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Third question. Now, it is not permissible to congratulate the disbelievers in their Diwali's, in their Easter, Halloween, in their Thanksgiving. It is totally prohibited for Muslims to congratulate non-Muslims for their festivals. We do not congratulate them because this is falsehood. So someone says, okay, but they congratulate us in Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. This is a, 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 the right thing to do. This is Allah's law, Allah's religion. And these two Eids are the only Eids possible to be celebrated legally and Islamically. Everything else is haram. Therefore, you should not do that. Then she says, why um, the people... Ask her, why do you go to the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ? She said, I go there to show and express my love to the Prophet ﷺ. I don't uh, yani, recommend such an answer. We go to the Prophet's mosque ﷺ because he told us that a prayer in his mosque is equivalent to a thousand prayers elsewhere except for the Haram of Mecca. We go there because of the tranquility we feel when we enter Medina. And we remember that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions lived and walked the same grounds we're walking. So it gives us a lot of uh, um, Iman boost and it would get us closer to loving them and knowing them more. So this is uh, uh, the reason that we should all have. Nadia from Saudi Arabia, she says, I cannot prostrate except while sitting on a chair. So where should I keep my hands? And this is a common mistake. A lot of the Muslims, those who pray and prostrate on their chair, when they sit down, some of them do this, like Superman is flying. This is baseless. What are you doing? They said, no, I'm making sujood. No, this is wrong. You put your hands over your knees and you, you lean forward more than what you do in rukur usually. This is the sunnah. And this is what the scholars say. But to put it in the air like this, or some people put a pillow, this is all uh, an innovation. Secondly, she says the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, when he said that the best of women is, are those who, when you look to her, that is your spouse, that she pleases you and she never goes against what you say, and she, uh, uh, she obey, obeys you, and she never goes against you, neither in herself nor in her wealth. So she says, can't a woman spend her wealth without the uh, permission of the husband? The majority of scholars say she has her independent uh, financial will. She can do whatever she wants with her money. And she does not have to answer to her husband uh, or take his permission to do whatever she wants to do. So what we do with the hadith? The hadith is... Uh, uh, was authenticated by Sheikh Al-Albani uh, with a Hassan 
um, uh, chain of, of narrators, and the scholars explain that by saying that she does not go against his will in her money, which he has given it to her, in the sense that we give our wives pocket money or money for the house to buy groceries, etc. Et this is not for her uh, uh, to keep or to use, it is for the house. So, in a way, it is her money in the sense that it's in her hand, but she has no free will to do whatever she wants unless the husband approves it. As for her own wealth, which she has made through her work, or she inherited or received as a gift, she, has, she does not have to report to anyone. Now, her husband, she says, that approved her to wear the niqab, and after a year, he changed his mind and said that it's an issue of dispute. She's not obliged to listen to him, because this is something personal. Even if there is a difference of, of opinion, she is not obliged to follow his uh, uh, opinion as long as she is convinced with it and she is okay with it. As for the children traveling without a mahram, meaning that women or girls in college going back to their country without a mahram, this is totally prohibited. And if you weigh pros and cons, would you like to go to college or would you like to go to college through hell? You're sinning. You are sending your children without a mahram, disobeying the Prophet ﷺ. You have to draw the line. You cannot say, well, she has to go to school. No, she doesn't. Even if she becomes illiterate and does not go to uh, uh, first grade to begin with, this is not the end of the world. Allah Azza would not question her or you on the Day of Judgment. Why didn't you teach your children how to read and write? Why didn't you send them to med school? But Allah would ask you, why did you send her without a mahram? And you have to prepare an answer for that. Abdul Hadi from Saudi Arabia says, what's the ruling on learning languages, but through uh, uh, mixing with boys and girls in colleges or in um, language institutions or centers, etc. This is totally prohibited. Learning a language, again, is it a priority? Will Allah ask you on the Day of Judgment, why didn't you master French? I did French for two and a half years, but I still do not master it. So is Allah Azzawajal going to ask me, why didn't you learn more French? No, because this is not part of the religion. But will Allah Azzawajal ask me, if I go to a mixed school, to uh, uh, learn a language, and there are girls they're sitting next to me, in front of me, and behind me, and we're mixing, and we're talking, and we're you know giggling, and chit-chatting, it's part of learning the language, it's okay. I have no problem, my wife has a problem with that. It is haram. You have to come to the conclusion that, what does Allah say about this? What's the ruling on this? Not because I follow my desires and whims, I could get thousands of, of answers uh, uh, to such problems. But what does Allah Azza wa Jal say? What does the religion uh, uh, tell us to do? And Rayhana's question is also similar to Abdul Hadi's dilemma. See, when you have mixing between boys and girls, sparks start to fly and fire is inevitable to ignite. This is human nature. You cannot put a boy next to a girl for six or seven hours every single day and say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, nothing had happened. There's something wrong in their hormones, whether her, hers or his. There has to be something that would inevitably happen. Because this is human nature, and this is why the Prophet tells us, Asalam, that whenever a man is in a seclusion with a woman, the third one, the third person with them is shaitan. What is shaitan is going to tell them? Fear Allah. Let's go and pray. Make zikr. Is he going to preach them? He's going to try his level best to lure them to fall into sin. So this, uh, as in Rihanna's question, a couple, a boy and a girl, fell in love. They go to med school in Kuwait. What do you expect? So now they're afraid of going into haram. They want to get married. Okay, that's good. But to get married, you have to follow the procedure in Islam, which means that 
you cannot get married if the guardian of the girl does not approve. And who's the guardian? Her brother, his, her cousin, her uncle. No, her father. As long as his, her father is alive, it is his say. If he gives a green light, he says, yes, I approve the marriage, then in this case, he has to propose to the boy personally by saying, I give you my daughter in marriage. And the boy says, I accept her marriage to myself. In the presence of two Muslim male witnesses, the marriage is done. Of course, with the consent of the girl. But if the father is back home, okay, can we make the marriage through him authorizing the elder brother of the girl who lives in Kuwait? The answer is yes. If he gives a written uh, uh, power of attorney to his son, then there's no problem. The son goes to the court with the written power of attorney, two male Muslim witnesses, and they do this procedure. But if the father does not agree and says no, no marriage this year or, or, or next year. You have to wait until you finish your med school. Then there cannot be any marriage. Sheikh, but they love one another and they're afraid of falling into haram. We cannot break the rules. The Prophet said Islam, that there is no marriage valid without the guardian or the approval of the guardian and two male witnesses. So if she marries with her brother's consent, this is not a valid marriage and they're living in fornication. So, يعني, subhanallah, Allah is protecting the boys and the girls from falling into sin, but we are digging a deep hole for them and telling them not to fall. We're throwing in the middle of the ocean, telling them not to drown while keeping their hands tight. Now, this is not the right way of doing it. Hussein says, is it allowed for me to wear pants? So basically speaking, he says that men, when they wear pants, it's tight, but not skin tight and not, not really loose. It's in between. When they prostrate and bow, inevitably the buttocks may be exposed in the sense the, the shape of it. So what's the ruling of the prayer? The prayer is totally valid. The majority of scholars and schools of thought say that as long as the awrah is covered, the shape is inevitable. It has to show. So it is permissible to uh, pray with pants. Umran says, is it allowed to work in cement manufacturing company? Cement manufactured might be used to building wine shops and temples. The issue of might is not the norm. You produce and manufacture cement. And this is generally used in everything that is halal. Maybe there's a 1% uh, uh, possibility of being in haram. This is not to your knowledge, so you're selling a halal product like those who provide electricity power or water or whatever. They can also use the same justification and say, we will not work and this is not a right thing to do. Mu'in says, is it allowed to compel a kafir to accept Islam? Definitely not. It is not permissible at all to force a non-Muslim to accept Islam. What does Allah want from someone who doesn't want to uh, accept Islam? What do we want from someone who does not believe in Islam to force him at gunpoint that you have to accept Islam? No, this is totally prohibited and not permissible and Allah Azza wa knows best. This is all the time we have. Until we meet next time, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.